Thank you very much. I'm Vahag Nikoyan from uh, OHSU. Today we're talking about something that I've actually never really read too much about, which is review of mesh industry lawsuits. In terms of disclosures, I'm a consultant for Care Syntax, Intuitive Surgical, and Medtronic, though these are not relevant to today's presentation. We've all seen the late night commercials, we've seen uh, the ads on uh, the internet, and we all hear from our patients about mesh lawsuits and whether or not mesh is a problem. Today's presentation, a lot of the content is based off conversations I had with uh, mesh litigation lawyers who were involved in multi-billion dollar trials. Um, all of them have asked to remain unnamed for the presentation though. So goals of presentation, we're gonna talk about and summarize some of the legal processes associated with personal injury related to mesh. We're gonna review the history of some high profile mesh lawsuits and we're gonna highlight best practices for surgeons, some of which have already been reviewed today. So how do mesh lawsuits work? A lot of us may actually be confused. I saw a few slides talk about class action and some other things and terms, so let's review those things. So some important mesh facts. Many meshes exist, hundreds of meshes exist in the, um, in the market, but most of these are not going through very rigorous testing with FDA approval through clinical trials. The way that they make it to market is actually through a process known as 510K. And so what happens is the mesh manufacturers have to just demonstrate substantial equivalence to something that's already legally marketed as a device that's in use. And oftentimes we'll then bypass like very rigorous testing. Another question that often comes up, are mesh lawsuits filed as class action lawsuits? And that's actually not true either. So you can't file a class action lawsuit in the setting of personal injury. These are actually known as multi-district litigation. What they do is consolidate thousands of cases related to a, a certain mesh or manufacturer, and then they'll trial them conveniently in a location that will allow for easy access for uh, lawyers and, and the mesh manufacturers and, and various other individuals associated with the case. Other people wonder, are cases considered on an individual basis? And in general, no, it's, it's impossible to trial thousands of cases. And so they often will consolidate these cases and then there'll be what's known as a bellwether. And I didn't know this, but bellwethers are the, uh, the sheep that wears the, the um, bell and sort of lead, is the lead sheep. So they'll usually identify three or four representative cases, which will then be what the in, entire suit will be based upon. So now the question, who selects the bellwether? Clearly there's a pendulum, right? And there's a spectrum of, of complications. If you're on the plaintiff side, you want to find the most morbid outcomes. And if you're on the defendant side, you want to find the least morbid outcome. So there's a lot of back and forth until they settle on what the bellwether cases will actually be. So how are settlements reached and funds distributed to patients? So what happens is that the bellwether cases are trialed, settlements are oftentimes reached, and then based on the morbidity and sometimes even mortality associated with the complications related to the mesh, patients are assigned like points. And based on the relative points that they receive, then they're given a relative settlement. So some of the common things that come up often. So let's talk about some historic mesh lawsuits. So one of the first ones that was very high profile was the Bard Composix Kugel Hernia Patch. Um, it's not in market now. Uh, some of you have probably taken it out over the course of your careers. Um, this is a polypropylene mesh and it has a very rigid ring. And as, as we all know, once you implant mesh, the mesh does change in conformation in vivo. Unfortunately for this particular mesh, that very rigid ring was not pliable and often would break. That break in the ring would result in potential uh, visceral interactions, penetration, erosion into surrounding structures, and so this was a, a defective product. And so the Kugel recall started happening in early 2000s. Over 130,000 units were recalled. Uh, and then in 2011, there was a settlement reached for a, a large amount of money, $184 million uh, for 2,600 cases. And this was one of the first dominoes to fall in these mesh litigation uh, issues. No mesh litigation talk would be complete without talking about transvaginal mesh. So after the Kugel, 
a lot of people started noticing and realizing that the transvaginal mesh systems were not working. And the, this is a real big and important moment where they had m many companies, like seven or eight companies that had manufactured these, and there was massive settlements on the order of greater than $8 billion in settlements. And there's still thousands of cases that still remain active, so I'm sure the final number will be even greater. Now, you see a number like eight billion, and you realize why mesh litigation has really increased, and you're seeing a lot more commercials on television nowadays. So another one that's currently still in trial is Ethicon's Physio Mesh. Now, there are certain Physio Mesh products still available, but Physio Mesh was developed. It's a polypropylene mesh. It's dual coated. Or it's coated on both sides with monochrome both on the visceral surface and the parietal surface. And it's resulted in what some claim to have poor incorporation of the mesh following repair, which is associated with increased rates of recurrence. So as of now, the laparoscopic version has been removed, not recalled from market. And thousands of cases are currently in MDL. The way that it's looking, it looks like a settlement's probably very near. I'm sure you'll hear about it in the news in the coming months. Another mesh that maybe some of you have heard about is Atrium Medical C-Core Hernia Mesh. So this was developed in Sweden, so we don't actually have as much information about it, but developed in 2006. It's polypropylene yet again, and it's coated with omega-3 fatty acids on the visceral surface, and omega-3 fatty acids anti-inflammatory, hopefully reducing more mesh visceral interaction. Unfortunately, it really didn't work that way. In vivo, high rates of infection, adhesions, fistula, and bowel obstructions. Um, so in 2013, over 140,000 units were recalled. Um, the FDA actually has blocked further manufacturing of this mesh, and there's over 2,000 active lawsuits currently in MDL. There's a, a, a bunch of other uh, trials ongoing, BARD, has multiple products that are currently under investigation, in particular products with PTFE, uh, 22,000 cases with concerns related to infection and recurrence rates. Uh, Covidian with their Pariatex multifilament. This is one of the few that's not a polypropylene-based mesh. Uh, the multifilament uh, Pariatex, of course, with the porosity, uh, some of the uh, the spaces that are present in the multifilament will make it difficult for macrophages to engulf and uh, control infection. So there's high rates of infection with some of these mesh products. So those are the big cases. The question we all wonder, is it the mesh, the mesher, or the meshy? And I think it's probably multifactorial. Uh, we all want to recognize that anytime we do a hernia repair, it's about technique and skill, about decision making, patient factors, and then recognizing your mesh properties. So let's discuss how surgeons should try to approach hernia repair when you're use a, using mesh. First and foremost, have a detailed conversation. So Dr. Coker did a wonderful job summarizing how to talk to patients, what to talk about, be transparent about the data, and know the data. Next, you gotta learn, again, the properties of not only the common meshes, but the meshes that are stocked in your ORs and know how to use them. A lot of, a lot of issues related to people not necessarily using mesh properly, and that is probably the most common issue that the manufacturers raise is that the meshes were not used properly. Document. You wanna document your conversations with your patients. You wanna document uh, very clear operative reports, and you want to highlight your rationale for using certain mesh products. And then inform. Uh, we're doing a, a complex abdominal wall reconstruction. We're doing redo, redo, inguinal hernias. When you're doing complex operations, they're associated with sometimes uh, complex outcomes. So patients should recognize not all complications are because of mesh. There's a lot of factors. So improving their uh, state preoperatively and hopefully maximizing your outcomes postoperatively can reduce the question of whether or not the mesh was the problem. So in conclusion, as it currently stands, mesh is oftentimes a necessary element to our repairs, and it's important to educate yourself about the mesh products that exist at your institution and the operations that you perform. And complications can be related to the mesh, but it's also important to recognize that it can be the mesher or the meshy. 
Thank you very much.